Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> welcome to the Compassion Consortium. I'm Reverend Sarah Bowen, and I'm joined today by Reverend William Melton and Victoria Moran, co-founders here at the Compassion Consortium. And tonight, our special guest is Maya Godfrey. Hello, Maya. In order to ensure we don't have potential disruptions within the space, we've turned off some of the Zoom functions. So you may see that some of the things you're used to doing, you aren't able to do right now. And that is intentional to kind of create this space here uh, for reflection and for conversation. If you're new to us, welcome. We're interfaith, interspiritual, and interspecies. Interfaith means we welcome people of any spiritual or religious tradition, philosophy, path, system of meaning making. We feature a diverse range in tonight, talking about vegan love. Interspiritual means that we believe underneath all of those religions and philosophies, there lies a commitment to three other common values, peace, compassionate service, and love for all of the earth community. And finally, we're interspecies, which means we consider the lives of and the needs of the others we share the planet with, some of whom I see on screen here and some of whom I know are in your spaces and outside your windows, which leads me to an opening poem for tonight. Tonight, we're gearing up for Valentine's Day or Valentine's Month or just love in general. But there are two animal-based holidays that have just passed, and I need to mention them. So first, of course, is Groundhog Day which many of us have conflicting feelings about as animal advocates, hashtag free fill. The second holiday is perhaps more in line with many of our ethics. Does anyone know what January 21st was? Elaine does, yes. Jul January 21st was Squirrel Appreciation Day. And in honor of squirrels, which may sound like a silly holiday, but think about it for a second. Without squirrels, we don't have nearly as many trees, and without those trees, we can't breathe. So squirrels are actually quite important, and I think very much worth our appreciation. So I'm going to start you tonight with a prayerish poem, often attributed to St. Francis of Assisi. It's quite short, but I'm going to ask you just to take a breath as we settle into the space together. And listen to this poem, prayerish poem doesn't require you to have any particular belief system, but may give you a chuckle. Here we go. It's called The Sacraments. I once spoke to my friend, an old squirrel, about the sacraments. He got so excited and ran into a hollow in his tree and came back out holding some acorns, an owl feather, and a ribbon he had found. And I just smiled and said, yes, dear, you understand. Everything imparts grace. So in honor of Squirrel Appreciation Day and my love for squirrels, I will transition us now uh, to a different kind of love and over to Victoria, who can introduce a little bit about what we're going to be doing tonight and who we're going to be speaking with tonight. Victoria, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Reverend Sarah. And it's also here of the rabbit. So just to uh, get another little furry being, have some credit. So it is such a pleasure to be introducing Maya Gottfried, who is someone that I have loved and admired for a very long time. She was born and raised in New York City. She loves animals and she writes books and essays and articles for kids and grown-ups. So we're going tonight to be talking about her wonderful book, Vegan Love, in honor of Valentine's Month. But Maya has also written three books for children, all published by Knopf. And she's written essays and articles published by Oprah Daily, Lilith Magazine, Stat Olster, and the Washington Post. She is married to her husband, Dietrich, and we'll hear a little bit about how that happened. And they have rescued animals, don't we all? There's our bunny, Oberon, Scout, and Midnight. Welcome, Maya. 
Thank you so much. It's so great to be here. And of course, I have loved and admired you for a very long time. Too. Oh, that's so I'm kind. Big fan. <laughs> well, so let us I... jump right in to talking about vegan love. And I'll just let people know how we're going to do it. You and I are going to chat for 30 minutes or so, and then we can open it up to conversation and live questions. But people who want to ask questions via chat can certainly do that as well. So obviously for there to be a book about vegan love, there's a problem with vegans finding love that uh, that you are trying to answer in this book. So what led you to believe that there was a need for vegan love? Well, there were actually two very specific conversations that inspired this book. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll give a little bit of backstory beyond these conversations, which is um, I went vegan when I was 35 years old. That was 15 years ago. And um, and a close relative who sh shall remain nameless at the time said that um, she didn't think it was a really great idea for a single woman in her 30s to go vegan because it might make her kind of high maintenance, like <laughs> not not um desirable to potential romantic partners basically she thought i would be a tough sell <laughs> um and i you know looked inside myself and i was like i'm doing this to save lives to save animals lives like you know that's the most important thing you know it's you know not what other people might think and i already had you know, the belief that in, when you live your truth, that's the, the right way, you know, whatever may come. Um, so, so that was the first moment where I was like, wow, there's some people have, you know, are going to tell vegans that it might, you know, be a bad idea in, when you're trying to go out in the world and date. Um, and then, so Soon after that, I was diagnosed with stage three cancer, colorectal mm. cancer. And um, so I wasn't dating for a long time. For about a year, I went through treatments. And then there was a, you know, a long period of recovery before I wanted to date again. And then as I was getting back into dating, um, I went out with a friend one night. We had sort of a girls' night out. And we were talking about dating. And she, when we were talking about meeting new people, she said, don't tell them that you're vegan. And I was like, I had that same kind of moment where I looked inside myself and I was like, this is a huge part of me. It's like a wonderful part of me that I think is, is beautiful and one of the best parts of me. And like, why would I hide something that I'm doing to make the world a better place? That doesn't make any sense. Um, so, and then I went out in the dating world and it went well and I lived my truth and nothing terrible happened and actually really great things happened. And, um, and I was like, I, you know, I want to help people who are out there who might be at the beginning of this path or even decades down this path and may be feeling as though veganism is, is not something to be proud of. And, and, Maybe they're afraid of telling potential partners that they're vegan, um, you know, and of course there are other things that can come up when you're in a relationship, not just when you're at the beginning of a meeting people. Um, but that was basically it. It was basically those two conversations sort of alerted me to the fact that there might be societal pressure on people around dating not to be true to their to their veganism and i wanted to offer them support and you do it beautifully the book is absolutely delightful if uh, people don't have it yet please treat yourself you will love it i had been married uh, 20 years when i read it but i still loved every page of it maybe that's just the romantic side of me so there seem to be two schools of thought, Maya, about dating and vegans. One is you go out and find a vegan. And the other is you just date somebody nice and see what happens. Or 
try to convert them. So are you in either one of those camps and help us out from one point of view or both? So first of all, thank you for the huge compliment about the book. I have to say that it means so much to me that you enjoyed it. And um, so I so I interviewed about three dozen pe- vegans when I was working on the book um, because I didn't want it to be me sort of telling people what to do. I wanted to sort of get the the group conscience and. Um, and so I actually learned a lot speaking with all these people and the, and the book took on a life of its own. Um, and I realized there was a lesson to learn um, that I, I was not aware of before I started this process. Um, and what I learned, one of the things I learned was that every single person is different. Um, so there are some people who um will look inside themselves and realize that they can't bear to spend their lives with a person who isn't vegan um and for those people like that's their truth and that's the path they should follow right um but for some of us we look inside ourselves and we're like oh you know what as long as i'm vegan um i'm at peace and I, I'm at peace with what my partner or spouse or just love interests might be, where they might be in their path. Um, so that that was the, one of the things I learned was that it, it truly is different for each of us. Um, and that the important thing is to have a good re- enough relationship with yourself to understand what your needs are in a relationship so that you can pursue that for yourself. So for me personally, um, there was a moment where I said, maybe I'm only comfortable with another vegan. Um, even though I did socialize often with non-vegans and that was fine. Um, you know, I'd go out to dinner with non-vegans and, and I didn't feel like I was, I was, um, hurting myself. Um, but yeah. So for me, I kind of, I was dating online. I, um, met a vegan who was like not an ethical vegan. They were a vegan for health reasons. I, I went out on a date with, um, I went out on dates with an omnivore. Um, and then I was like about to give up on online dating <laughs> because I just didn't like it. <laughs> and, um, I did one last search uh, for vegetarians and some pictures came up that I hadn't seen in my other searches. Cause I'd only been searching like vegans when I was looking for people who were in the plant-based realm. And, um, so someone came up who was a vegetarian who I had not seen their profile before. And we're in a spiritual community here. So I feel comfortable saying the, the, the complete story that I'm not always comfortable sharing. But, um, you know, whatever you call your higher power, the universe, spirit, God, for me, it's God. You know, I, I, I almost heard a voice in my head tell me, go look at this person's profile. Don't send them a message. They're going to see that you looked at their profile and they're going to get in touch with you. So I did exactly that. And I heard from him and now we're married. (laughs) So, um, so I'm big on, you know, following those messages when they come through. (laughs) Um, but, uh, yeah. And he was vegetarian at the time, um, and had been vegetarian a whole lot longer than I had been vegan or vegetarian. So he had saved a lot more lives than I had. And, um, And at one point we were just out at lunch and he asked me what was, you know, why I was opposed to consuming dairy. And I explained it to him and, you know, it was, it was in him. He just, you know, as soon as he heard the truth that resonated with him and he went vegan soon after that. Oh, what a beautiful story. Now, was this before or after the book? This was before the book. Um, I wrote 
a blog post while we were actually in the early stages of dating about, I think it was called honesty is your best policy about dating as a vegan. Um, and it resonated with a lot of people. And from there, I wrote the book. Uh -huh. yeah. Like it, it started as a blog and then I expanded it into a book. I wrote it when we were, we already were living together when I, when I wrote the book. So you're coming from experience and from also talking with all of these other people. And it's wonderful. Sometimes we do find vegan love, but there are a lot of people out there in mixed marriages, mixed relationships, vegan, non-vegan, vegan, vegetarian, vegan, omnivore. Do you have any wisdom on navigating those? Yeah. Well, what one of the things I learned from interviewing all these people, you know, I heard about how a lot of different relationships operate. Um, and the vegans I spoke with generally, um, cook, you know, cooked a lot at home and often their partners or spouses would eat their food. Um, and they just sort of organically, a lot of them started moving in a vegan direction or even becoming vegan. Um, so again, you know, navigating those relationships, I think it's all about um, being true to yourself. I mean, that's what I learned, you know, from speaking with a lot of other people, um, you know, not hurting yourself, like, say you're in a relationship with someone who is an omnivore, and they ask you to go to the grocery store and pick up someone, right? If that is going to be painful to you, um, then it's important to speak up and set your boundaries like you would with anything else that would be painful. Um, you know, the, the, it's totally possible as we, we know from experience that, um, you know, to be in a mixed relationship, but it's specific to the individual and it's, from what I've learned from other people, it's just always about being honest, but also respectful of the person you're with and not hurting their, you know, wording things from the I perspective, like respecting your partner, not judging. We don't want to judge them, right? But we still want to express what we're not comfortable with. So it's it's finding that de delicate balance where we're following our principles as far as relating to other people, um, but still protecting ourselves so that we don't get hurt mm -hmm. by like doing something that we feel bad about. Very wise. So what if somebody really wants to date only vegans or maybe vegans and vegetarians, where do they look for them? So, um, I, I actually, there's actually a list in the book, um, that expands on all of these a little bit. Um, but, uh, so farm sanctuaries are of course a great place to find a vegan to love. Um, there are a lot of lovely vegans at all these fun events at farm animal sanctuaries. Um, and the events are coming back. I know a lot of them were canceled because of COVID, but the sanctuaries, are coming back to life. And um, so events at sanctuaries, there are most cities, I think probably all cities, there are like vegan meetups um, where you can have dinner with a group of vegans and probably meet other vegans. Um, book signings, <laughs> all the fabulous vegan books um, that come out. You can go to a bookstore, a book signing at a bookstore and meet another vegan. Um, veg fests are a great place to meet other vegans. Um, and, uh, they are coming back to post COVID and my, my favorite way to meet other vegans is activism. Um, because you're already both passionate about something like you, if you're at, you know, I don't advocate going and doing activism just to meet <laughs> someone else. <laughs> but if you are passionate about something and go and, you know, 
speak your mind and, and act on behalf of the animals. I think that's a great way to meet other like-minded people. Well, that sounds like so much fun. I'm so happy that COVID is coming to an end. It was hard enough if you were in a relationship and could work from home and everything was fine. But you think about people that are just, you know, trying to get things started in their lives and it's a lot harder staying inside. So Mm -hmm. every writer, I think, has a kind of prejudice, like parts of their books or certain chapters or certain ideas. They just love And the rest of the book is fine, but some of them they're crazy about. So tell us some of the concepts or some of the sections in Vegan Love that you just think are brilliant and you love to pieces. Wait, me? Talk about? Yeah, your favorite parts of the book. Um, I mean, I just loved hearing other people's stories. So to me, my favorite parts of the book are when people are telling these stories that are like totally surprising, like when um, there was one story, you know, one of the interviews I did with someone where she was going out on a, a woman was going out on a first date with someone. And, um, and she was like, he took her to a steakhouse and she was like, Oh boy you know, how am I going to get through this? This this is going to be awful. And she thought this person was just being totally disrespectful of her. And, um, and they got there and he was super like protective of her, like made sure she, she had like a great selection of food to eat. And the server was really accommodating and she ended up having like a really wonderful time. Like, I love those kinds of stories. And, um, My favorite thing about the book, though, is um, it was, I wrote it during a very fierce, I mean, it still is, but the politics in America were extremely fierce when I were, when I was writing it. Um, And there was just a lot of anger out there, you know, and that I was seeing in my community. And I found it very disheartening. And my favorite thing about the book was I just kept hearing story after story after story about how love spreads. Mm -hmm. It was like, I was like, oh my gosh, this is, this is what we need right now is like, evidence that love wins, you know, love spreads. And I just heard story after story about people living their truths and then the people in their lives coming closer to veganism just organically by being around someone who was living an example of peace and love. And then that spread, like the people they were living with began to take on those qualities. Um, There are so many stories of it in the book. And um, that was my favorite thing was like, yeah, like stepping back at the end of it and being like, oh my gosh, the, this, these interviews are evidence that love spreads, love wins. Oh, that's really sweet. Love wins. Happy Valentine's Day. So (laughs) in the book, you not only talk about finding vegan love, but you talk about the wedding, which is just so fun and cool. So tell us about vegan weddings. This was really fun for me. And um, actually it ended up leading to, I, after I wrote the book, I ended up writing, um, if, if, anyone's familiar with veg news and their weddings issue. Um, Ever since the book came out, veg news has been having me write their weddings, annual weddings feature. So since the book, I've, I've written even more about vegan weddings and it's what's so amazing is how things have changed over the past few decades. Um, You know, it used to be uh, years ago, you know, if you wanted a vegan cake, you would, you were probably going to be baking it yourself or enlisting, you know, friends or family to bake it for you for what, for a wedding. Um, And now there are so many bakeries who will bake a vegan wedding cake. It's not, you know, so hard 
to do it. Um, one of the uh, things I, I learned writing the book was that almost, well, traditionally, almost all uh, wedding dresses were made from silk, um, at least the really expensive ones. And I even called Kleinfeld, um, from, you know, say yes to the dress. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I asked them, I, I just called them randomly. I didn't tell them I was writing a book. And I asked them if they had any vegan dresses in the store and they said not one. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think that's probably changed since then. Um, actually, um, Vivian Westwood, who I was a big fan of and sad that she passed um, recently, but her company um, has been making vegan dresses to order, wedding dresses. Um, so you can get some really incredible uh, vegan wedding dresses. You can also, uh, if you don't, if you're not working with that kind of a budget or just don't want to spend so much on a dress, um, there are plenty of synthetics or more earth-friendly um, fabrics like cotton that you can get dresses made out of. Um, I, I got married in a very small backyard ceremony and I got a Diane von Furstenberg cotton, like white and pink cotton dress. That was really oh. fun. Um, <laughs> and um, the, the one thing that I, I heard, learned while I was writing the book is that um, uh, a lot of venues, a lot of wedding venues come with built-in caterers where you can't bring in your own caterer. Mm -hmm. So that's something you want to think about before you book um, a venue is, are they gonna be able to provide a good vegan meal? Because sometimes they will provide a vegan meal, but um, you'll go to the tasting and it'll turn out it's just like a plate of steamed vegetables. <laughs> um, and, um, but yeah, if you, you know, if you, you get, if you have your wedding in a space where you can bring in your own vendors, then, you know, your options are wider. So there's a lot. And, um, oh, and if you're looking for fancy vegan shoes, um, you know, you can get, I, I wore, um, used, uh, Stella McCartney sandals for my, and they were vegan. So for my little outdoor ceremony. <laughs> That's so, and you're bringing back so many memories because William and I had a vegan wedding in 1997 and my daughter and son-in-law, and that was in Kansas City. And we ordered vegan petty fours from Sacred Chow, which was a wonderful yeah. restaurant in Greenwich Village. Unfortunately, did not make it through the pandemic, but just a classic restaurant. And that was so cool to have a little bit of New York in our Kansas City vegan wedding. And then um, my daughter in 2005 had a vegan wedding and it was just, it all came together, you know, finding the venue. Although William and his daughter drove out to Pennsylvania to get the wedding cakes and they came back and I looked in the trunk of the car and there were all these chocolate cakes. And I was like, no, no, my daughter is supposed to have white wedding cakes. And bless his heart, William drove back to Pennsylvania, but they couldn't take back the chocolate cakes. So we had double cakes and people were just like drunk on cake. It was lovely. Absolutely lovely. Cool. So uh, as we open up for questions uh, in a little bit, we can just talk all about vegan love and have all kinds of lovey romantic questions. But I want to ask you a few things, Maya, that are kind of off topic, simply because you are such a fascinating human being. Thank so you. if you would be willing, because we are a spiritual organization here, to share a little bit about how you see life spiritually. Oh my gosh. Well, this is, I've, I've had such a path. I mean, we all do. Um, so right now where I, my spirituality, I see as like a really beautiful patchwork blanket, um, right now, um, it's a combination of a lot of faiths and, um, 
But in practice, for my practice, the most important things to me are prayer and meditation, um, which I think, uh, you know, no matter what faith you are, those are are things that, you know, well, for me, they're they're very helpful and mm -hmm. um, connect me with with my higher power. Nice. Um, uh, my path, though, started, um, you know, I grew up in a household where I was told I was half Jewish, half Christian, but we didn't have any spiritual practices at home. So it was really just like Christmas, Hanukkah, Passover, you know, Easter. And um, I didn't really have a faith. I did not. I did. It's not that I didn't really. I just did not have any kind of spiritual practice when I was like growing up. So I kind of uh, worked out my spirituality as an adult. And, um, you know, unfortunately, ended up at a at a meal where someone at a Passover meal where someone told me I wasn't Jewish because my, my I, I could not be half Jewish because my mother wasn't my mother. <laughs> I had three Jewish grandparents, but um, my matrilineally, I'm not Jewish. So then I I went very Christian and um, now I've come back to identifying as half Jewish, half Christian. But as I said, my spirituality is a patchwork of many different faiths. And I see the different um, spiritual traditions as like fingers on a hand um, and that they're all from the same source. And, um, and, you know, they all have to work together. Right. That's, that's how I, that's how I see it, that that's where I find peace is in the integration of those different, um, faiths. What a beautiful quilt. So oh, <laughs> I, I have heard that you are friends with James von Prague, very famous psychic medium. Can you tell us a little bit about that and kind of what that has taught you about life after death and the great beyond? Well, um, oh my gosh, I hope I can count James as a friend. He's really amazing. And he gave me a really beautiful quote for um, vegan love. He was very supportive of this book. Um, and uh, so, so if anyone's not familiar, James, yeah, is like a very famous psychic medium. medium and he, he had a television show that I used to watch religiously when I was like in high school um, where he gave readings and it was, it just blew my mind. And more recently, he, now he devotes himself to teaching others how to do what he does. Um, he's really become a great spiritual teacher. And I've gone to some of his workshops at places like Kripalu and Omega. And, um, and so I was just, one of the people in his workshops and then I was at this workshop and um, all these Wizard of Oz references were being made throughout the workshop and my grandfather <laughs> played the Cowardly Lion in the Wizard of Oz so I was like this is very strange <laughs> that I'm at this workshop where we're channeling the spirits of our family members and all these people are mentioning things that have to do with the Wizard of Oz so I went up to him during a break and he's a big celebrity. So he's like a little, like, you know, keeps a little bit of distance between him and everyone in the group. And it was, it was intimidating going up to him. I wasn't sure how it was going to be received. And I just sort of blurted out like, Hey, have you noticed there are all these Wizard of Oz references at this workshop? Like my grandfather was Bert Lahr who played the Cowardly Lion in the Wizard of Oz. And he just kind of looked at me <laughs> and then I ran into his assistant later and was like, was that weird that I said that? Cause he was there when I had said that. And he was like, no, 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 it's fine. James is going to talk to you later. And I was like, huh. <laughs> and, um, and I found out that it wasn't just going on in the classroom, it had been going on for them, like in their lives outside of the classroom too, all the Wizard of Oz references. And from that moment on, James and I were friends and I, I like saw him at an event that evening. And, and when, as the event was starting, someone was playing somewhere over the rainbow oh. on the piano. 
<laughs> and James looked at me and he was like, you're freaking me out. <laughs> and he like grabbed me by the hand and took me over to the piano. And he like, he's like, tell him who you, your grandfather is. It was, so we had a really nice friendship because of that. And, um, and, uh, and then later he, he's just always been supportive of me and he was really supportive of vegan love. And he gave me a really nice quote that's up on Amazon and, he's, he's really great. And he's a great teacher. And, you know, those workshops were incredible. I mean, I really felt like I connected with different, different people and it was great. And so you do believe that it's possible, at least for some people to communicate with the souls of those who have gone on. So, I mean, it's funny because even James says he's a skeptic and I feel like I'll never know like a hundred thousand percent for sure, but I have heard things and I have told people things that it's hard to imagine how, you know, someone else could know without having had that communication. But I suppose I, you know, I can't guarantee it, (laughs) but, uh, (laughs) but I, but I've seen and heard a lot of amazing things related to that yeah as have i there is more to heaven and earth horatio and all that okay we're starting to get some questions and please do your questions in the chat the first one comes from monica and she says i feel like entering into a relationship with a non-vegan hoping that they will convert is a slippery slope how does one balance hope versus expectation? Hmm. Well, in my experience and from speaking with all these different people, I think definitely um, at any time we go into a relationship wanting to change the other person, that's n- not going to be good for the relationship. Um, it's hard for me in my relationship. And, um, uh, but, you know, um, yeah, hope, I mean, I hoped that, that Dietrich might, um, eventually be vegan, but I accepted him the way he was. And, um, and, uh, yeah, I think, you know, if, if you feel as though, you're never going to be happy unless the other person's vegan, then maybe you want to try to find someone who's vegan already. Um, But if, but if you find someone who you really connect with um, and you're able to accept them as they are, um, you know, uh, that sounds great. And having hope, you know, I never think there's anything wrong with hope, but going in with the expectation that things will change or wanting to change another person. Um, I think that can be damaging, um, to a relationship. And again, like as a human being, I can't say I'm perfect in that area, but that's what I strive for is acceptance. Yeah. And then I believe this is also from Monica, kind of a follow-up question. And how do people reconcile having such different core values? Uh, That's a really great question. Um, I think it's different for everyone. Um, You know, I can't, I can't speak for anyone else. Um, I try when I have different, I have a friend at work, we have very different, um, sort of socioeconomic backgrounds, um, different politics. Um, But when I talk to them, I see their beauty as a human being who's different than I am. And would I, you know, be in a relationship with someone with such different politics? That's not something that I would personally do. Um, but I find a connection with them. And I think that for some people, they're able, you know, to have a relationship with someone with very different politics. And for them, that's 
that's going to work. And, um, you know, for, you know, for each of us, it's just so different. So, so for one person having that difference in core values is not going to, you're not going to be able to reconcile it. And it's just important to know that about yourself. Um, and then for someone else, it's fine. I, you know, I know someone who's, um, who's very, very, very vegan and works in animal advocacy and they're their partner is not vegan. It doesn't mean it's not super important to them. It just means that in their heart that, you know, it, they can have love and compassion and closeness to this person without having that in common. It is, it is truly, there is not one way of looking at it. Um, and it is truly from what I've learned, it's about being able to realize what you need in your life personally. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's interesting. The better you know yourself, the better any relationship is going to be. So uh, Kelly has a question. I love this because I could have so echoed it uh, 25 years ago. What are the vegetarian and vegan dating apps with the best chances of meeting a normal man? you know, someone who isn't weird. And that was exactly why I started dating William when he was still an omnivore, because I had been through the sensitive spiritual vegetarians and it just wasn't working. So Kelly, thank you for this question. How do we find the apps for the normal guys? Oh my gosh. (laughs) I mean, I wish I had a good answer. (laughs) Honestly, um, I don't know currently the apps um, that are best. And I wish I could give you a really great answer because I would love to be helpful. (laughs) Um, When I was dating, I was on OkCupid, which was like a million years ago. It was a website. We didn't use apps to date back back in the day. Um, And I don't know what apps people are using these days, Um, but I would, uh, you know, connect within the vegan community, maybe like some of those places I mentioned earlier, like when you're at events, maybe you can ask other people like tap into crowd crowdsource for, for the great apps. I I'm sorry that I don't have a great answer for you. I really am. But I know that if you, uh, if you um, ask that question in the right to the right person, you will, you will find out. Thank you. And uh, Reverend William. So I am married to you in case people don't know that. So Maya told a story that was very close to how we met and ended up getting married. And it's one of my favorite stories. So I was just wondering if you could share that with people. Would you be willing to do that? Yes, if nobody minds. Did, did we already tell this one on a previous thing, Reverend Sarah? No, you told it to the st- to the chaplaincy students when oh, you came okay. to visit. Oh, okay. All right. So I it, just it, <laughs> but not uh, not folks in general. And I think it is a delightful story that Maya might want to put in uh, book two, your follow up <laughs> to Vegan Love. <laughs> okay, so you said that back in the day, people were using websites instead of apps. Well, back back in the day. People were using paper newspapers and uh, William ran an ad. And, you know, it's all so funny, this whole thing you're talking about, the whole spirit world and everything. I was out, was living in Kansas City then, and I was just driving around. I was really busy and I felt the presence of my first husband who was deceased. And I'd always felt him kind of on my left arm and shoulder But it had been nine years, and I hadn't felt that in a really long time. But that day, I felt him and this really strong message of go into Muddy's Coffee House and pick up a copy of The Pitch, which was kind of like the village voice in Kansas City at that time. And it was so strong, and it felt so much like it was coming from outside that I actually said, all right, just leave me alone. I'll go pick up the stupid paper. And I picked up the paper and threw it in the back seat. And it was in that paper that um, was William's ad. 
So uh, we, we had met and we were getting along and things were starting to look really good. And he'd been so respectful. I mean, we always went to Italian or Mexican or Asian kinds of restaurants, places where it was easy uh, for me to eat vegan. And he ate vegetarian out of respect. And then he called me and we were going to have this special date. So he came over with a wrapped box and I'm thinking, ooh, who lingerie. And I open it up and it's a Kansas City Chiefs sweatshirt. And I know they're going to be in the Super Bowl, but I would still not wear a red sweatshirt about a football team for any reason. And I mean, as soon as I thought that, saw that, it was like, oh, he doesn't he doesn't get me after all. And so that was just about it. And then we arrived at the restaurant, which happened to be a sports bar. And instead of, you know, ordering whatever they might've had that was vegetarian, which I think was toast, at least that's what they had that was vegan. I had toast. He orders this big steak and he didn't even have the decency to ask for it to be well done. And I'm thinking, you know what? I thought this was going to work, but mm -mm. so I was polite, you know, through the evening and the next morning he called and he said, I've been thinking and I'm over there thinking, you know, I've been thinking too, buddy. And he said, I've been thinking that I'm not going to eat meat anymore. And that was the beginning, you know, he wasn't perfect from day one, but that was his, his vegetarian beginnings. And the vegan thing came later. But had I, you know, done the red paint thing in, in that sports bar, I think we would not be together and the Compassion Consortium would not be consorting. And we lived happily ever after. I, I love hearing that, Victoria. Thank you for sharing that. So tell me about your, your, may, can you talk about your, your current position, just what you do and what that's like? You sure. don't have to say uh, where you do it. Yeah. I, I work at, um, at a shelter, an animal shelter and I'm the marketing director. Um, yeah. So and my uh, question is, and I'm sorry, I kind of ask a half a question. So my okay. question is, you know, you're, you're working in animal protection with very dedicated people who are literally 24 seven there for cats and dogs and rabbits and gerbils and lots of other animals. And yet many are not vegan or vegetarian. How do you, how, how do you do it? And, <laughs> and how, how do you share your veganism with them? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, well, what's amazing and I love is that there are five of us in the office and three of us are vegan. So Ooh. that's to start. Uh, yeah. In the administrative office, three, three out of five of us are vegan. So um, that's pretty amazing to me. I don't think that would have necessarily happened in an animal shelter a couple of decades ago. So. Um, and how do I sh share? I always speak from the eye perspective. Um, I never talk down to people. I, you know, I've learned that when you're working in animal welfare, you, with anyone, you want to be respectful and not talk down to them. But these are people who are going above and beyond for animals. And any implication that they are doing something to harm animals is going to put them on the defensive and just upset them. And they're not going to really want to talk to you anymore. I mean, um, it's, 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 um, I, I just am very, very careful to, to speak in the, um, uh, from the eye, the eye perspective. And I'm like, this is why I do it. And usually if I say it in a really nice, respectful way, then people start to ask, me questions or they'll start to warm up and be like, well, I kind of, I kind of was thinking of going vegan, but I struggle with going to my family's house and, you know, uh, 
and, and they always want to cook. And then I say, well, this is what I used to do with my family. And this is what happened. And that's how I handle it um, with people I work with. And then there, you know, there are, there are sometimes opportunities in the broader, in the bigger picture um, to move in a vegan direction too. Um, but that's how I handle it with like the people I work with. Um, because it's true. I mean, you know, the people I work with, the volunteers and the staff are just putting so much into helping animals and, and are, you know, will generally be very sensitive if they feel as though um, they're being judged as being cruel to animals. Yeah. You are such a kind person. I think that's what we're all, you know, trying to be. I him so we're trying to be so, and you just you just exude it. So, a uh, final question of the evening. Nikia is asking, "What's the next book?" Oh, is that Nikia Hargrove? Okay, I, I'm wondering if that's a friend of mine, Nikia. Uh, okay. Um, anyway, what is going to be the next book? Gosh, I hope it's the. Franken Cow, which is a middle grade graphic novel I've been working on forever. Um, and I'm working on revisions right now. And there is um, a vegan part of it, um, but it's it's more of a fairy tale about, I'll, I'll, I'll just do the tiniest elevator pitch, but it's about a middle grade aged boy who's lonely and doesn't have any friends um who is very very good at science and decides to bring a cow back to life wow <laughs> cool so that's, that's what i've been working on forever um and i'm working on a revision of the script now so Ooh, i love it i'm ho i'm hoping you know that i get it it, it hasn't been um you know, there's no contract, no publisher yet. I'm hoping for the um, for the words to come to make it what it needs to be to get it out into the world. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and you you will. And finally, I said that was the last one, but I lied because we have one okay. more. This is from Kelly. What steps would someone take who has no experience to get a paying job at an animal shelter or sanctuary? with no experience to get a right. job at it. number one piece of advice start volunteering where you want to work like if you can I mean sanctuaries it might be hard if it's far away from you um my two jobs that I've had at animal welfare organizations I started as a volunteer um and it is a great way um to get get in get the experience and and know when the jobs are opening and you'll already have a relationship with the with the administration and um even if you don't get a job there you will get the experience that you need to pursue a job somewhere else so absolute number one suggestion is to start volunteering Thank you. Maya, you have given us so much. You have given us the road to love and employment <laughs> and uh, spirituality. So uh, um, there's you. not a lot else. Thank you so much. And I'm oh. turning it back over to Reverend William going to do announcements. We have our next service on February 26th at um, 4 p.m. And our special spiritual guest will be Candace Laughinghouse. And she is a PhD student at the Chicago Theological Seminary. She is a hereditary Pentecostal preacher and a highly recognized authority on eco-womanist theology and animal rights. So we're all very excited about having Candace with us on February 26th. And we hope that you will be able to join us. And I think, Reverend Sarah, that is my only announcement for today. Fabulous. I have one more, which I put in the chat, as well as the link for Sunday service. 
which is that if you enjoyed tonight's event and you would like to make a donation to the Compassion Consortium to help us with programming costs, there's a link there for you. Thank you, Victoria, as always, for your deft and fabulous uh, interviewing skills and your heart that you bring to this. Thank you, Maya, for being with us tonight and sharing your experience and your knowledge and uh, put a link in the chat also to your information and for folks who, you know, there's still five days before Valentine's Day. Uh, so Vegan Love, if you are if you want to cram course beyond tonight, pick up Maya's book. And thank you all for attending tonight. It was very, very wonderful to have you with us tonight at Compassion Consortium.